Mother, why can't you understand? I'm in love with Jenny and she with me, Mark said, gesturing at Celia. Alice, playing Mrs. Squires, was wearing her hair done up in a style appropriate for the time period of the play, but her jeans and black t-shirt didn't fit it at all. Mark, as Jenny's lover Roland, was at least dressed in a suit. Celia, though, was feeling quite ridiculous. She had been called on stage in the middle of getting fit for a proper dress. That meant corset and shift, which was all she was wearing right then. None of the others seemed to mind, apart from Bobby, who had been oddly silent the last couple of days. "'Roland, please don't make a fuss,' Celia simpered, putting a hand on her chest and reaching the other out to Mark. He took it and pressed a kiss to her wrist, flashing a look at Alice. "'Listen to the child, Roland,' Alice said, snapping her fan. "'Don't do this.' "'That's not what I,' Celia said, again to be interrupted, this time by a look from Alice. "'Isn't it? My dear Miss Bertram, I know you mean well, but you should do what is best for Roland. He has next to no fortune, his only prospects lie in Parliament, and you have no connections to bring to him. In fact, you have no fortune at all,' Alice snarled, turning her back on Celia. "'Harsh,' Celia thought privately, but outwardly, all she did was cover her mouth with her hand and force tears to come to her eyes. "'Mother!' Mark scolded, dropping to the couch to sit beside Celia. He reached out as if to put his arms around her, but she pulled away and stood, looking between the two other actors on the stage. Then Celia fled. The moment she was off stage, Tony whisked her away to finish with her dress. She complied happily, not wanting to talk to anyone about her performance. It had been so long since she had done anything like this, and Rafe wasn't being much help. All he would say was, "'Thank you, and you're doing wonderful.' "'Too tight?' Tony asked as he buttoned up the dress." Celia twisted and flexed, stretching her arms and moving about as her character would need to. "'The bust feels loose, but the shoulders are a little pinched,' Celia said. Tony grumbled and tugged at the fabric. She held still and let him pin and do whatever he needed with the dress, taking it off when directed. "'I'll get this sorted and we'll squeeze in a fitting later,' Tony said. "'You want me to take care of it?' Celia asked, reaching for her real clothes. "'I can try it on and fix what needs to be done. That way you can deal with Bobby's dresses.' Don't even get me started on Bobby's dresses, Tony grumbled. I hate working with starlets. They want everything just so, want to be shown to the greatest advantage, no matter what the actual fashion was like. And she is one more costume change than any of the other women in the show. At least you can sew. How about I come by your room after rehearsals and we can get working on them? If we're diligent, we should be able to get most of them sorted before morning, Celia said, putting on a smile, even though she didn't really feel like smiling just then. But Tony needed it more than she did, so she smiled. You're a treasure, Celia Graham. Tony patted her cheek and shooed her away. She changed and returned the bits of her costume to the appropriate garment bag and rack. Then the niggling feeling that her cue was coming sent her towards the stage. She had time to realize that her cue was still a ways out before she stopped, watching and entranced. They were like magic moving together. Celia knew all the words, and yet watching Bobby and Grayson work together was a new experience. So she stood in the wings and watched. Anselm, Bobby breathed, loud enough for the audience to hear, but only barely. We need to talk about Roland and Jenny. Why can't we talk about us? Grayson said, stepping towards Bobby. She took a step back, bringing her hands up to her chest in a protective gesture. You know why, Bobby said. I'm promised to Mr. Pearson. You know that. There's nothing we can do. It's done. It's not done until you say your vows, Celia, Grayson said, and Bobby gave him a half smile and turned towards the faux window at the back of the set. Celia, Grayson said again, this time pleading. I know where things stand with me, Anselm. You shouldn't. You should just accept that. I'm worried about my sister. Jenny isn't acting normally. She's being secretive and subdued. I know there was a confrontation with your mother, but she won't tell me anything else. Bobby was the one to take a step forwards now. Grayson tightened his expression and looked out over the audience. I'm afraid she's going to do something she would be ill-advised to do. What, like marrying for love? Grayson snapped. Bobby recoiled and sat on the couch, looking stricken. Celia, I'm sorry. That was cruel of me. I know this is difficult for you, Bobby answered, but I have given my word. And yes, Jenny loves Roland, perhaps too much, given the circumstances. I don't understand, Grayson paced the stage. It's because of the money, isn't it? The fact that my father's estate was left to me as the eldest son. Jenny has only a small dowry and Roland isn't wealthy enough for her, is that it? Jenny is my sister and my dearest friend, Bobby said. She took a deep breath. I would do anything to secure her future and happiness. Grayson froze and rounded slowly on her. He then dropped to his knees before the couch and kissed her hand. That's why you're marrying Mr. Pearson, isn't it? So that Jenny can have a proper dowry, so she can marry Roland. You already know the answer, dearest Anselm, Bobby said, sounding as if her heart were breaking. Grayson lay his head in her lap, facing the audience, and she stroked his hair gently, lovingly. I don't deserve you, he said. Bobby took another deep breath and then waited five seconds. Right, that's the end of the scene and first act, Rafe called out, climbing onto the stage and thereby releasing the actors from their poses. 
Bobby stayed where she was and Grayson merely moved to sit on the couch next to her, as casual as could be. Celia stepped far enough on stage to be seen by the manager. She was in awe of the magic that could be created for her before her very eyes. The bittersweet taste in her mouth wasn't just from the poignancy of the scene, though, and it took all of her mental strength to acknowledge that. There was a knot right in the middle of her chest that told Celia she would never truly be part of that world, the world of acting. She had known it before, and her pitiful by comparison performance was enough to confirm it. Rafe, Alice said, walking out onto the stage with a tired look. Walt was a few steps behind, Mark next to him. Can we stop for the night? My feet are killing me, and I haven't eaten for a good portion of the day. We've already run the first act seven times, and we'll keep running it until I say so, Rafe snapped. We need this to be perfect. The better it is, the better the reviews. The better reviews, the better turnout. The better turnout, the better the money, Celia cut in, her own temper about as done as Alice and the others. She was normally the first to agree to work harder and later, but not tonight. Tonight, she just wanted to lay in her bed and read, sulking until morning when she could get up, perfectly all right with the world. Unfortunately, she had already promised her time to Tony. At least he wouldn't try to talk her ear off when she was unwilling to listen. We're all tired, Celia continued, rubbing her shoulder to relieve some of the built-up tension. And we've been through Act 2 already, so it's not new. No, but it needs to be perfect, Rafe retorted. Celia was inches away from snarling back when Grayson cut in. How about we all take the night off, he said, staring straight at Rafe, silently reminding him who the money in the situation was. We can go out for dinner and rejuvenate. My treat. Those last two words were enough to press the point home. Rafe held up his hands and gave his best smile, proving that he had once been as great as any of them. You win, Rafe said. Go on, gather your things, we'll meet outside in ten minutes. No one needed anything else. They went off to grab their bags or change out of half-completed costumes. Mark practically dashed past Celia, calling out a good job tonight to her before vanishing in the, into the men's dressing rooms. Celia shook her head and went to grab her own bag before helping Tony with the costumes. She had taken an armful of garment bags and was moving to the back door when an arm on her shoulder stopped her. Uh, wait, where are you going? Celia turned to Grayson, who had changed and thrown a thin leather jacket on over his shirt, making him both dashing and dangerous. Bobby was a few feet away, purse over her shoulder and looking on with a masked expression. Celia didn't need a neon sign to know that Bobby was unhappy. Back to the hotel. Tony and I are going to get the rest of these sorted out, Celia said. Yours will be done. Sure thing tomorrow, Bobby, she directed her words at the other actress. Let me know if there's anything else you need and I'll get it sorted. You're working too hard, Grayson said, smiling. Come on, take a break with the rest of us. He tugged on her arm to get her to come along. The last inch of Celia's temper frayed, and she jerked her arm back, her expression turning neutral. She barely managed to keep back the snarling words and took a deep breath. I need to get these done, Celia said flatly, especially if any of you want to have costumes for tomorrow. She turned to the back doors and pushed them open, ready to slam them behind her and leave the others behind. Wait, Grayson called, following after her. Hold up. Celia stopped and glared up at Grayson, the knot tightening in her chest. Oh, what's wrong? You were always so ha calm and happy. Did we do something wrong? I just need time to recharge, Celia said, jerking her chin in a nod to Tony, who was emerging with the rest of the costumes in his arms. I'll see you tomorrow. She stalked off with the head of costumes, leaving Grayson and Bobby and the rest of that world behind. She wished she had never agreed to play the part of Jenny. She wished she had never given up being nothing more than an assistant. She was even beginning to wish that she had never come to France. All it was giving her was heartache and memories that should have stayed buried.